okay let's uh, continue so uh, in the last class we looked at the issue of uh, process variation and random mismatch so just to shortly summarize uh, process variation refers to the variation in the mean of the component values from chip to chip okay and if you take one particular chip and if i again plot the distribution of all the component values that will have a gaussian distribution like this okay so this mean value will be some nominal value r or not plus or minus some percentage of the nominal value and this variation in the mean is due to the process variation and around this mean you have a distribution that is due to random mismatch okay and uh, if in the case of a resistor the actual value of the resistor will be the uh, mean value plus some delta r so if i again sketch the distribution of delta r alone that will also be a gaussian distribution with a zero mean okay and uh, we saw that to quantify this mismatch we use the relative mismatch take the standard deviation of it so for the capacitor we have a similar quantity coming to mosfet the current factor mismatch is again relative whereas threshold voltage mismatch is not normalized and uh, how are these uh, related to the area of the device it's inversely proportional to total okay so we again saw this with an example and uh, this was called the pelgrom's law after uh, marcel pelgrom who came up with this thing so i wanted to quickly clarify something in the derivation so let me so again to understand this result we took an example where we had a resistor made using a material with a width w length l we told it had some sigma delta r by r we saw we decided to see what will happen to this variation if we form the same resistor using twice the length and twice the width so and uh, we ended up with some expressions like this so here uh, this was the final relative mismatch we got right and uh, here i have taken the expected value of that quantity square so what is expectation of uh, x square what does it signify ah uh, it no it is not the variance i mean if your expectation of x square it is not exactly variance what is ah uh, it is power or okay it is a power or basically the mean square value i mean expected value expectation is mean i am taking the mean of the square quantity okay mean square but here i have taken sigma square of something what does it what does sigma square signify ex square minus ex square yeah yeah in ha huh? it is a variance okay and i mean uh, if you think about it i wanted the standard deviation which is the square root of variance but for computing it i computed the mean square value I mean, basically, I took the mean square value and equated it to variance in short. Is that correct? Why is it correct? Yes. Yeah. Basically, it is true if mean is zero. Okay. So, I mean, variance, as you know, it's uh, expectation of x minus x bar whole square. Here, the mean was zero, so I can do this. Okay. So, it's a minor thing. I just uh, directly wrote it. Hopefully, it's not confusing. Okay. and there is one other important thing i will want to iterate again so here uh, if you look at it the relative mismatch we obtained as uh, sum of four quantities and all the four quantities are uncorrelated so their uh, mean square value or their variance or the total variance was basically sum of the variance of individual quantities because we told the cross i mean uh, they are uncorrelated so the expected value of the cross products become zero in this thing okay and this reiterating this so this is uh, we'll use this quite often in all our calculations so if you have some random uh, variables say x1 to xn and if all of them are uncorrelated and on top of it if they have zero mean if i obtain some other quantity x 
as sum of all of these then expected value of x square will be sum of the individual mean square values okay and this is of course equal to the standard deviation also so this is true only if you have the individual random variables to be uncorrelated and zero mean okay so this is quite often i mean we'll use this quite often because in practice we'll have multiple uncorrelated random mismatches or noise sources they will add and give something at the output to find the effective mean square value or uh, variance we take the sum of the individual variances so i mean usually we say that uncorrelated and zero mean sources they add in power it's a very loose term basically the total power is sum of the powers of the individual quantities okay cool so if that is clear let's uh, look at some examples so let's start with a simple current mirror a classic example where we heavily rely on matching between devices so let us say this carries a current i not nominally if both the devices here are exactly identical the current in the second transistor will also be i not right and again uh, note that here if the even if the transistors are identical if the drain voltages if the drain voltages of these two transistors are not equal the current will not be exact but for uh, ease of analysis we assume that r not is infinity so the current depends only on the gate to source voltage so nominally if both of them have the same threshold voltage vth and the same current factor beta this current here will also be i not okay now of course that will not be the case so in practice let us say the second transistor has a threshold voltage vth plus delta vth current factor beta plus delta beta so this current also will be some i not plus delta i so let's quickly try to find out uh, what this variation in this current will be so of course the uh, current in the first transistor the diode connected transistor is i not this beta times the vgs minus vth whole square straight forward in the second transistor the current is i not plus delta i so that is beta plus delta beta times vgs minus vth square okay now uh, to find what delta i delta i is one uh, trivial way is to expand this guy right so if you expand this guy you will have uh, basically a term i mean if i delta i will be some delta beta times something i mean what are the what are the terms we'll have if you expand it you have one term corresponding to i not right you'll have beta times this guy that will cancel i not so what will be the other terms i'll have i'll have some delta beta into something delta beta into the whole term yeah yeah so that's what i've written something yes. i'll also have some delta vth times something correct uh, i'll also have delta uh, vth uh, square uh, right i can also has delta beta delta vth isn't it i can have all of these terms right sir so last time we already explained that no i mean okay you can i'm make sure making sure these terms don't have delta okay so all these terms don't contain any delta i'm taking out all the delta terms separately and writing it okay so this is this will be the delta i but if i were to get a decent approximation to this what can i say what can i ignore or what can i include so i mean Yeah, so basically, all these terms I'll ignore, right? This is essentially similar to your uh, small signal approximation, where your nonlinear expression is there, 
you approximate only i mean you say that for small variations ignore the second order and higher order terms so i can say that delta is approximately uh, delta beta into something plus delta i times something okay so now you can see that uh, this now we can clearly separate this into two terms one only due to delta beta one is only due to sorry not delta it's delta vth right sorry right so first term is only due to delta beta where delta vth can be assumed to be zero right and to get this term i'll assume delta beta to be zero okay again this is similar to the uh, you know uh, case where if you have a small signal circuit if you have multiple input sources to find the total input what do you do you superposition and you find the response due to each individual source something similar you have two sources contributing to delta i i have already ignored all the nonlinear terms it is linear so i can use superposition that's all so let me quickly find out what these two terms are so let me copy this circuit so first i'll find what is delta i due to uh, beta variations and if i consider only beta variations i'll say delta vth is zero okay so vth is same so this is going to be delta i due to delta beta so now i can write it i not plus delta i due to the beta variations will be beta plus delta beta times vgs minus pth square so this i'll write it as uh, beta times i call vgs minus vth as overdrive plus delta beta times u over i square so this is basically our nominal current i not so delta i due to the beta variations square so i will do this so this term is again i not so this is delta beta by beta times i not that's all okay so this is the change in the current you will have if there is any variation in beta change in the beta okay so i'm um, one uh, easy way to uh, understand this is i mean one easy way to model it is as follows we can assume that both the transistors have the same beta okay now i see that i have an extra current which is this guy so what i'll say is i'll say that i have some additional current added like this okay so in that way you don't have to worry about it for easy analysis you can do this always so both of them have the same beta but you are adding some additional current i mean it depends on the direction you can work out whether it's going up or going down so, so this is due to beta variations let's uh, next let's find the change in the current due to threshold voltage mismatch so here i'll assume that there is no mismatch in beta so now i not plus delta i is beta times the vgs minus vth minus delta vth square so i'll slightly rewrite this i'll rewrite it as like this vgs minus delta vth minus vth square okay so the reason why i'm writing it like this is uh, because of the following reason now i can assume that this is my new vgs okay vgs prime and the threshold voltage is vth right so again the case is now i can assume that both transistors have the same threshold voltage so both of them have the same threshold and beta now right but what is difference here yeah there is basically a voltage source of delta vth between the gates <coughs> so again for modeling i can do this this will be delta vth 
so now i have a case where the transistors are matched just that there is some difference in their gate voltage so now to find delta i i can uh, use my small signal approximation right so i know that if there is any change in delta vth this voltage is not going to change because you are pumping in a constant current here so oops this is i not so this gate voltage is fixed so incrementally it is short right so now it looks like i have applied a uh, voltage incremental voltage minus delta vth to the second transistor so what will be the corresponding change in the current what will this incremental current be equal to yeah i mean uh, be careful delta i due to delta vth is the gate voltage is minus vth here right so the current is minus gm times delta vth okay i mean you can again expand this and ignore the higher order terms you'll still get the same thing this is again the small signal approximation that we have directly used is that clear so this how we'll uh, do our all our uh, mismatch calculations so we'll assume that the transistors are matched and the mismatch in the threshold voltage will model it as an effective change in the gate voltage that's all and then you can use all small signal analysis because this delta vth is small so now let's me write the complete delta i so initially we had delta i due to beta variations which we calculated to be this and this. Okay. now again uh, instead of looking at i mean now if i have a current i not nominally the change in the current is delta i now if i not increases this delta i is also expected to increase so instead of looking at delta i i look at the normalized quantity delta i by i not so this is going to be delta beta by beta minus gm by i not times delta vth okay so this delta i by i not is again a random quantity so instead of looking at the actual value what should i look at it is makes sense to look at the standard deviation right absolute value doesn't make sense so if i look at the standard deviation so again first i'll find the uh, variance or the mean square value because again uh, mean is zero so variance is same as mean square so what will be what will this be equal to 1 by beta square times i mean yeah i'll write it as variance of this right and then is it minus yeah, it's plus okay is that fine basically again we have two uncorrelated sources which are zero mean so the variance of the overall term is variance of each of these okay, that's all cool and uh, of course i know that uh, this is if you remember uh, this was each of these relative mismatch was proportional to 1 by root wl so if i use those expressions i'll have a beta by wl okay plus i'll have gm by i not the whole square a vth square by w this is my variance so now it's uh, from this let's say if i want to reduce the variation in the current or the change in the current due to mismatch due to beta the only thing we have to make sure is this term itself is small that is not under your control mostly because a beta is fixed by the process so you can only increase the area right now the uh, error in the current due to threshold voltage mismatch which is the second term you see that it depends on this ratio gm by i 
so you have an additional control in your design okay so if i want to have uh, delta i due to delta v th to be small i need to make sure this ratio is reduced okay and you will be biasing this with a fixed current so i not will be fixed so if i not is given what should i do how should i design it huh? i mean i want to have this ratio to be small i am saying i not is fixed you are biasing at a fixed current so what is the quantity that i should i should minimize gm okay and uh, for a given current if i am trying to reduce the gm yeah we are not reducing voltage increasing voltage because gm is to i not by voltage voltage if i am reducing this i am increasing this because this is fixed so what it says if i have if i operate my device with a large voltage voltage or large gate to source voltage the error in the current due to the threshold voltage mismatch is small and that should make sense because let us say i have a voltage drive of 100 millivolt and let us say uh, my delta vth is some 50 millivolt now because of this threshold voltage mismatch what will be the effective voltage drive i mean it's plus okay. i mean remember effective um, voltage drive is vgs minus effective threshold voltage right this is the threshold voltage is vth plus delta vth ah what will this be voltage drive is i have already given ha huh? 50 millivolt is that okay it will reduce by 50 millivolt here fine but let's say i start with a larger voltage drive say some 300 millivolt let's say i have the same 50 millivolt what will be the effective voltage drive now 250 millivolt so the change is pretty small right because you have a large vgs minus vth to begin with even if there is a small change in the vth value it will not finally affect you so much it's like stealing 1 rupee from 1000 rupees versus stealing 1 rupee from 10 rupees right same thing and one other thing now uh, let us say uh, so yeah one thing is you should have a large uh voltage right? okay and uh, also for a given current i not what is the expression for gm what is the expression for gm if uh, current is fixed no 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 you know different expression huh? Ah, uh, so under root of two times i times mu and cox w by l, right? Okay, so G M square I have, so it's two i not mu cox w by l. I have i not square c square v t h by w l. Okay, so here w goes off, so I'll be left with uh, a beta square by w l plus two mu cox. by i not okay so now you see that uh, for a given current this is fixed this is fixed this also fixed by the process so you need to use longer channels longer lengths okay so to minimize the uh, current mismatch you need to have uh, longer lens for your transistors okay. and in practice what you find will be that the uh, change in the threshold voltage will be dominant than the mismatch in the beta factors okay so mostly we'll consider only the mismatch in the threshold voltage because in practice that is what will be dominant most of the time so it's most of the time not always true so the bottom line is this uh, if you have two transistors in the case we had a, i mean we considered a current mirror but if you have two transistors wherein if there is a mismatch in the beta that can be modeled as the transistors having the same beta 
but an additional current is added appropriate current i'll not write it you can find out what that current is similarly if they have if there's a threshold voltage mismatch you can model it by assuming the transistors have the same threshold but you can add a series voltage source between their gates okay cool so now let's see what uh, this mismatch means for our op amps and in all our op amps if you uh, think about it this is our basic structure always this differential path with the tail current source is the basic structure on which we built all our op amps right so here you can have anything you could have a current mirror so we'll use a current mirror if you want a single ended output or you can have current sources for fully differential case right and uh, here all the assumption i mean in all our calculations earlier we assumed that the two branches here were all identical now that's not going to be the case okay now let us say there is uh, no mismatch in the transistors if i were to plot the uh, input output characteristics where in x axis i am plotting the differential input voltage y axis is the output how how do you think this will look like i mean it's small signal right everything is small signal my small signal output is going to be how is it like huh? sorry 90 Directly yeah directly proportional but it's i mean output is gain times my input right so it will do something like this with a high slope okay now let's say there is mismatch in the transistors and for simplicity if you assume uh, threshold voltage mismatch between these two guys we saw we can model it as though the transistors were matched but you have some voltage source in series so how do you think the curve will now change it will shift yeah it will shift to the left or right depending on the polarity of this voltage source right earlier if i had zero input my output was zero but now i see that i seem to have added some additional voltage source so it makes sense that the characteristics will shift to the left or right like this okay. so basically this introduces an offset in all our op amp so uh, of course you'll have mismatches due to all the transistors in the two branches all of them will result in some kind of offset so we'll try to calculate uh, what this offset is for each of the op amps and before that i'll take a short detour and uh, let us understand some basics of noise because uh, once we know the understanding of noise we can calculate both noise and offset for all the op amps parallelly okay so uh, to introduce noise let's say i have a resistor and i short this if i measure the current flowing through the resistor ideally what do you think the current will be it should be zero but in practice if you exactly try to measure it you'll notice that you'll have this random fluctuations in the current okay and that's uh, mainly because the electrons in the resistor or electrons here they will have some thermal energy due to the fact that we are operating at non zero temperature so they'll have random motions and because of that there will be random fluctuations in the current also oops this went away but uh, what can you comment about the mean value of this current zero. yeah it should be zero why is it i mean let's say you don't know anything right huh yeah why why does it make sense thank you yeah yeah it's what it makes sense it should be zero okay i mean even if you don't know anything if let us say this is non zero so it means that to solve the energy problems of the world i just need a bunch of resistors i love resistors it can deliver current all problems are solved right but that's not the case right now so even if you take a voltage source and apply it like this say it's 1 volt on ohms 
now the current is going to have an average of 1 amps and on top of it you will have this random fluctuation. And the best analogy to explain this behavior is what uh, Professor Kalmarkar from IIT Madras uses. I mean, let's say uh, you have a sweet box kept on a table. You have flies and other in insects hovering around the sweet box, but the sweet box is stationary, so there will be no effective movement of the insects. They will be just randomly moving around the sweet box, but it will not move on an average. So that is like having this case where the average current is zero, but still you have random motions in the electrons. Right, but now let us say I apply a voltage source so that I have an average current. That is as though we are pushing the sweet box to the left or to the right. Now the insects will follow the sweet box, but it won't follow straight. Right, it will randomly just wiggle. That's basically this. It's a nice analogy. Okay. Anyways, now that you know this uh, noise exists and this noise is basically a random signal. It's not a deterministic signal, so at any time instant, I do not know exactly what the noise amplitude is. Okay, so how do you deal with such random signals? Huh? If you have deterministic signals, I mean, I can use all the you know uh, things that you have learnt in signals and systems. But it's a random signal. What do you do? How do you analyze? Now we have to rely on statistics. That's all. You guys have taken a course on probability random process. Okay, cool. So yeah, so instead of looking at the amplitude and other stuff, it makes sense to look at the mean and the mean square. Mean is basically the average of the signal. What is mean square? Mean is average. So similarly, what does mean square value signify? I mean, that's just one power. Why are you saying DC power, AC power? It's a signal. We are finding the power of the signal. It's the power. Okay. And uh, luckily, it turns out the random signals that we deal with, uh, they are called, uh, they are white sense stationary signals. And uh, in simple English, it means that the statistical quantities that we will be looking at, they don't change with time. And it turns out for uh, the such stationary signals, there is one other parameter that does not change with time and that is called the uh, autocorrelation. Autocorrelation is not the relation between autos. What is it? Huh? At least mathematically, do you guys know what that is? I mean, have you heard of this term or first thing? Okay, so what is it? Yeah, so basically it is expected value of some x of t with x of t plus tau. See, this is the mathematical representation, but see physically what does it say? It says that, it says how the signal at these two time instants are related. In other words, if let us say my autocorrelation is large, if let us say rxx of some tau naught is really large. So, if I know the signal value at some time instant t1, I can say with a good confidence that sorry, not t0, the signal value at t1 plus tau0 will also be similar to this. right? Because it is a random signal, I cannot exactly say what each point will be. But if with autocorrelation, with a good probability, I should be able to say what the signal value at each time instant will be. If autocorrelation is 0, it means that there is absolutely no relation between this, these two values. But if it is very high, I can say that they could be very close by. right? And uh, if I take the autocorrelation at uh, tau equal to 0, what does it give me? Rxx of 0, what does it give me? It is the expected value that is of the x square, which is basically the power. Okay, so if my uh, if at any point the autocorrelation is close enough to the power of the signal, it means that the samples are really really same. So, okay, okay. So this is uh, about this time domain properties. But as with deterministic signals, we get more intuition. If you also look at 
frequency domain so uh, so we can do the same thing for random signals also but you know the signals are random so if i take the fourier transform every time i calculate it's going to be completely random but it turns out if i take the uh, magnitude of the fourier transform do it multiple times and basically take an average of that that tends to a constant value constant in the sense that doesn't change a lot okay and uh, what is the units of fourier transform by the way if let us say x of t is a voltage signal what is the units of x of f voltage per hertz any other units okay what is x of f how do you find it take it off let's write it what is x of f x of t into some exponential thing into dt so what is the units of this if this is volt this has no dimensions what is this second so this is basically volt per hertz like you told okay so this basically has units of volts per hertz okay in other words this is basically a uh, voltage spectral density okay it's a density function like all your probability density functions it says in a 1 hertz bandwidth what is my voltage is sensed that's all but with random signals uh, it doesn't make sense to look at the absolute voltage or amplitudes and you already know that the average is zero right so it makes more sense to uh, define something for the power and uh, that is called the power spectral density hopefully you have heard this term okay psd and what is the units of this voltage spectral density has units volt per hertz volt square per hertz okay now i see that uh, expected value of let's say this guy gives me volt per hertz i want to get something which is volt square per hertz how can i get it okay that's a good start if i take a square of the this guy what will be the effective units per hertz square right but i want volt square per hertz so what is the additional thing i have to do i have to divide something which has dimensions of time and it turns out to be the time for which you observe the signal okay and uh, this is the expected value and ideally you want to observe the signal for infinity so it turns out this is how the power spectral density is defined i mean it should be uh, it shouldn't be surprising because let's say i have x of t i took fourier transform to get voltage spectral density now i want a power spectral density so how can i find the power in a signal from x of t from x of t how can i find the power no no I, give me the uh, actual operation i'll do yeah let's say some signal how do you do we don't know if it's periodic or not how do i find if if i, if I am given x of t how will i find the power in x of t minus ah, t some integral minus t by say 0 to d that's okay ha ah. yeah real signals i can take x square of t dt and then 1 by t and i have to tend t to infinity this is the power in the signal isn't it so i mean that's why you see that i mean this thing also comes in the definition of power spectral density right i mean that's why you have that other terms just a very qualitative explanation mathematicians will fight with me if i explain it like this but yeah but uh, hopefully you get the point okay so uh, what we'll be using in the course is power spectral density which is defined it like this so 1 by t times expected value of uh, mod fourier transform square okay. and we saw this as units of volt square per hertz so it's essentially a density function so if let us say i find that power spectral density has some plot like this 
at some frequency f not if i say that the value is s not it means that at f not around f not in a bandwidth of 1 hertz okay i have a whole continuum of frequencies infinite frequencies in this 1 hertz bandwidth and the combined power of all those infinite frequencies is s not okay so in this 1 hertz bandwidth which contains infinite number of frequencies the combined strength is power is s not it doesn't say that uh, my signal has a sinusoid at a frequency f not with a power s not okay remember it's a density function similar to probability density function the actual value at any point is still zero that is if i were to find the power of a sinusoid at a frequency f not that is basically the uh, combined strength of all the sinusoids which is s not and you have infinite such sinusoids in that bandwidth will be zero is that okay it's, it's exactly analogous to your probability density functions so only if you have impulses in your density function if i have some impulse at frequency f1 with the power in the area of the impulse say some s1 then i can say that my signal has a sinusoid at a frequency f1 with a power s1 okay cool and uh, it turns out again this power spectral density is an even function so it will be symmetric like this again should be surprising power at even frequencies same as power at odd frequencies so usually uh, you also represent it you don't represent two sided power spectral density because it's mirror image so you combine both of them and it's only one side so if this is some s this will be two times s so this is one sided now the other way to interpret power spectral density is this uh, say i take a signal x of t and pass it through an ideal bandpass filter with a center frequency of say some f2 and bandwidth of 1 hertz so the output i'll get some signal i'll take the power in this signal that will be equal to my power spectral density at f2 again it says what is the power in the signal around the frequency f in a 1 hertz bandwidth okay is the point clear Hmm? Cool. So uh, now you know that power spectral density at some—I mean, the value at some frequency or the power spectral density at some frequency here gives the power around that frequency in a one hertz bandwidth. Now, if we have to find the total power in the signal, which should comprise of all the frequencies, what should I do? I have to basically integrate the power spectral density from zero to infinity. Okay. At one frequency, I get. I mean, if I uh, find the value at one frequency, it gives the power around that frequency in one hertz bandwidth. Now I'll do that for all frequencies and sum it up. That's the total power in the signal. So here again, I, I assume that this is uh, two side. I'm sorry, one sided power spectral density because I'm integrating only from zero to infinity. Okay. Now uh, here we also saw the uh, power in the signal. power in the signal was also the auto correlation at zero right so this was also rx x of zero so so what do you think the relation is between the auto correlation and power spectral density i find that if i take the integral of some fourier transform it is equal to the value of some other signal at zero so how are the two related yeah this uh, if i take the fourier transform of auto correlation that should give me power spectral density okay is that okay so the take away from all the discussions is that we'll be using power spectral density 
it's a density function so it has units of whole square per hertz and the physical intuition is you take if you take the uh, power in the signal at a frequency in a 1 hertz bandwidth that gives my power spectral density now let me just uh, mention few of the properties sure you know it so let's say I take a signal x of t give it an amplifier a i get some y of t if this is x x x of f power spectral density what will be the power spectral density here a square okay it's a power so you multiply by a square times s x x of f done so now let us say i take the same signal give it one lta filter with a frequency response h of f i get some y of t what will be the power spectral density of this guy so here i see that the amplifier has a gain a for all frequencies so it doesn't matter so here this has different gains at different frequencies so if i am interested in the power spectral density at some frequency f i look at what is the gain it provides at that frequency f and for sinusoidal uh, frequencies it's basically mod h of f square okay right and if i were to find the total power in the signal i will if i were to find the mean square of this how do i do that i have to integrate the power spectral density from 0 to infinity okay so these are the things you have to uh, be comfortable with so this is essentially sxx of f again remember all these are one sided psds if it's two sided you integrate from minus infinity to plus infinity so these are the things i want you to be comfortable the all the other back stories to uh, build up to this point it's okay if you not very comfortable with those things okay cool so now let's get back to the resistor business so as we saw if we have a resistor there is some going to there is going to be some noisy current okay and it turns out the uh, power spectral density of that noise current or let's say i will first look at the noise voltage that's relatively easy so that's uh, 4 kt times r again one sided psd okay this is all one sided by default we'll use one sided hmm? so k is uh, the boltzmann constant so what is its value yeah what is the unit joules per kelvin is it okay work out so t is the temperature in kelvin 4s are 1 2 3 4 4 and r is the resistance value r okay so uh, say plot the power spectral density versus frequency it's going to be like this 4 kt r okay so if i try to find the total power in this uh, noise voltage what do you think this will be right right we are going to integrate this it looks like it's infinity so you know obviously that's not the case because it turns out uh, in the derivation of this thing people didn't consider quantum mechanics and the moment you take into account of uh, quantum mechanical effects at really high frequencies this actually uh, falls down in physics you might have heard about this black body radiation this max planck right so initially people thought a black body can have infinite can radiate infinite energy or infinite power but then max planck told that it happens only in discrete packets blah 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 but it turns out this is the case but till few tens of terahertz let's say few terahertz this is still white and this is basically all our practical range of frequencies okay even otherwise if you have a resistor will always always have some parasitic capacitors from either of the terminals to ground so that will limit the frequency the frequency of operation to well below this frequency so for all practical purposes we can assume that the power spectral density is constant which is 4 ktr 
and such a noise is called white noise again from ray optics which has all white white light has all frequencies okay and this is often called the thermal noise also because the origin of noise is due to the thermal agitation so i'll just make one last comment in, in the class so if i have a noisy resistor just like how in the case of mismatch we model the mismatch as having the transistors to be identical but we added the effect of mismatch as some voltage or current we'll do the same thing we'll assume that the resistor is now noiseless but in series i have a voltage source vn so this is noiseless yeah value of vn we don't know but its sparse spectral density we know which is 4 ktr 4 ktr volt spectral now just like i have i can represent i mean if i have a voltage source in series with a resistor i can also represent it as a current source in parallel with the same resistor so what will be the value of the current source no no i mean if this is vn what this is current huh vn by r source transformation right okay and uh, so basically power spectral density of in will be power spectral density of vn by r square so that will be 4 kt by r units will be ampere square again both this is all noiseless so this how we'll model it and uh, we'll see how we'll calculate noise from next class this problem